Hey, AP Macro Kids. All right, so next lecture we're going to go through. Uh, we're talking again macro measures. So we're talking how do we measure major things in our economy. Today we talk in unemployment. So as a quick review, uh, the business cycle, right? It goes up and down through time. And I had a bunch of different spots on here. Oops, right there. So take a sec, pause the video, see if you can figure them out, and then I'll walk you through them. Okay, so let me get my mouse here. This one, let's start with number one. Uh, number one is the peak. Two is a trough. When it's the downward slope, that's three. That's a recession. When it's an upward slope, four is expansion. The distance between the full employment line and the curve, number five is a measure of inflation. The distance between the full employment line and the trough is number six. That's unemployment. And then seven here, this black line is full employment. So try and get those down. And we kind of talked last time about where we're at in this. So moving on. Our second goal of macroeconomics uh, is to limit unemployment. Uh, we have had highs and lows throughout our history. So um, obviously it's good when people are working. So what is it? Unemployment. Workers uh, that are actively looking for a job but aren't working. Um, that is what unemployment is. You have to be actively looking. Once you've given up, it doesn't fit the criteria anymore. Uh, the unemployment rate is the percentage of people in the labor force who want a job but are not working. So we use this to calculate that. So we take the number unemployed divided by the number in the labor force and we times it by 100 to get a percentage. So that's your important formula there. So labor force, what is that? Um, here's what you need to be to be considered in the labor force. One, above 16 years old. Two, able and willing to work. Three, not institutionalized. So we don't count people that are in jail or hospitals or things like that as unemployed. That Those are institutionalized people. Um, not in the military, in school full-time or retired. None of those are counted. So um, if you're a full-time college student, then you're not counted towards the unemployment rate. Uh, a stay-at-home mom, they're not unemployed. The reason for that is that they are not actively looking for a job, right? They are capable, they could have a job, but their job is to be a stay-at-home mom, therefore they are not considered unemployed, right? So you got to fit these criteria into the labor force to, to kind of get into the rate. Okay, there are three types of unemployment. First one is what we call frictional unemployment. Frictional unemployment is a temporary unemployment or being between jobs. So individuals you're, are qualified to work and they have transferable skills. Their skills are still relevant. They can be used in other places. So examples here, if you're a high school or a college student looking for a job, um, like right after graduation. So you graduate high school this year, you go into the workforce uh, and you there's a month period where you're looking for a job. Then you would be considered frictionally unemployed, right? Think about friction two things rubbing, right? So it's, you're in between work. Uh, individuals that were fired and are looking for a better job. So if you lost your job, got laid off, you're frictionally unemployed. Right now we have quite a bit of, well, yeah. So if you, we'll get to that, sorry. And then seasonal unemployment fits into here. So it's a specific type of frictional unemployment which is due to time of the year and nature of the job, right? So if you are the ice cream delivery guy, right? You work in the summers and probably not too much in the winter. So you're frictionally unemployed through the winter, right? Um, a lot of agricultural work kind of fits into this. Um, all kinds of stuff, anything that's a seasonal job. The next type of unemployment is structural unemployment. So structural unemployment, changes in the labor force, make some skills obsolete. 
These workers do not have transferable skills and their jobs will never come back. They must learn new skills to get a job. So the structure of the system has changed and the skills you had, the job you had has now become irrelevant. It's not needed anymore. Um, it's the permanent loss of these jobs uh, we call creative destruction, right? We innovate, we come up with better ways to produce things, better ways to do things. We're being creative, but in the process, we are destroying some jobs that may have already existed. So kind of the easy way here, VCR repairman. Um, if any of you still have a VCR, hats off to you, but there's probably not a lot of demand for guys to fix VCRs these days. Uh, the milkman uh, pretty much doesn't exist anymore. Um, although I do have one, delivers milk to my house every Monday morning. So they do still exist. Uh, usually technology drives this. So type of technological unemployment, type of structural unemployment where uh, automation and machinery replace workers, right? So this is where we see a lot of this. We invent some kind of a computer or a robot that can do the job better. Therefore, their job is no longer needed, right? So the structure has changed. So that's your second type. Those first two types of unemployment happen. We're okay with them. I'm gonna skip that. Okay, so the third type uh, is what we call cyclical unemployment. This is the bad one. This is the one we don't like. We try to avoid this at all times. This is one that we have a lot of currently in our economy as of two weeks ago. Cyclical unemployment is unemployment caused from a recession. So a downturn in the economy, negative growth. As demand for goods and services falls, demand for labor falls and workers are fired or laid off. This is sometimes called demand deficit unemployment. You'll hear that in technical papers and things like that. Um, there's less demand, therefore we don't need as many people working. Uh, we see, we're seeing tons and tons of this right now. Um, restaurants are laying off a lot of their wait staff and bartenders because they don't have the demand, right? All they can do is take out right now. So that's leading to cyclical unemployment. Examples of this, um, a steel worker laid off during a recession, anyone laid off during a recession, um, restaurant owners, fire waiters after months of poor sales due to recessions. Again, things that were are a little too real right now. Uh, high unemployment during the Great Depression. Um, sorry, we saw a lot of cyclical unemployment. Uh, the big recession back in 2008, really high numbers. So I think in the Great Depression, Unemployment rate peaked at about 25%. The big recession, it was in the mid-teens. Um, coming out of this, I've seen some pretty lofty projections getting us well into double digits, maybe into the 20s. We even heard 30s thrown around, but time will tell on that. Okay, so is all unemployment a bad thing? We have to talk about what we call the natural rate of unemployment. So many people assume that our goal is zero unemployment. That's not true. We like a little bit of unemployment in our economy. Here's why. So frictional and structural unemployment uh, are present at all times because people will always be between jobs or replaced by technology, right? There's always gonna be someone who quits their job to find a better job or you know, was working one job and got hired for a new one. So they're in between, they're frictionally unemployed for a couple weeks. There's always going to be structural unemployment. There's always going to be new technology. We can't avoid those, right? So if there's just frictional and structural unemployment, then our economy is doing well. Uh, so the economy is doing great if there's only frictional and structural, right? That's what we're aiming for. So the natural rate of unemployment, uh, we take the frictional plus the structural unemployment, um, the amount of unemployment that exists when the economy is healthy and growing, right? So when our economy is thriving, we have our natural rate of unemployment. The full employment output, uh, the real GDP created when there is no cyclical unemployment, right? So that means we are doing the best we possibly can, right? There's no downturn. Um, that's what we're aiming for. So in the U.S., 
uh, to be fully employed, we want to be somewhere between 4 and 6% unemployment. We say 5% unemployment is the natural rate of unemployment in the United States. Um, before the COVID stuff hit, we were at about 3 uh, just over 3% unemployment, so we were actually above that 5% that we aim for, uh, meaning our economy was kind of too hot. It was moving too fast. Um, most economists would have told you something's coming, right? Some kind of a slowdown. Uh, now our unemployment rate, we don't really have a read of it yet, but when the new numbers come out, it's substantially higher than it was. Okay. So just some interesting compar comparisons here, uh, graphs that we've learned in the past. We see unemployment used in these. So the PPC over here, uh, capital goods, consumer goods, right? The red line here represents full employment. So if we are at full employment, we are using all of our resources. Remember we said anything on that line is efficient. Anything beyond that line is impossible. That's full employment at 5% unemployment. Maximum capacity is this blue line. That's if we were at 0%. So technically, if we're getting really detailed on this, we could produce out here on the blue line, right? We could have 0% unemployment, um, but that would usually send some alarms off. That doesn't mean we have a healthy economy. So just, it, it adds a curve to this because you're kind of like, what was impossible is now, okay, we could actually be there out here beyond the blue line is definitely impossible, right? So you can kind of see the difference there. Um, so that's 6% unemployment, right? So if we have, this is when we're not producing so much. So if we're at six, seven, eight percent we're inside of the curve. If we're at 4% unemployment uh, or 5%, somewhere in that natural rate, we're on the line. And if we are super low unemployment, we have high inflation, we're going to be out beyond this, right? It's possible to get there, um, but it's not the healthiest spot. Same thing over here on the business cycle. You can see different unemployment rates. So when we're down in the trough here, we have really uh, high unemployment. When we're right here on the intersection, we have our natural rate of unemployment. That's where we want to be. And when we're up here at the peak, we are um, really low, right? So before COVID, we were up here at the peak, right? 3%, we had really low unemployment. So we kind of saw that. And now we are definitely down here somewhere. So we've dropped quite a bit. So you can kind of see the business cycle is currently happening in front of your eyes. Okay, so... An interesting thing to think about, um, we say the natural rate of unemployment in the U.S. is 5%. It's not that way across the world. So in places like France and Germany, it's between 8 and 10%. So they just naturally have a higher natural unemployment than we do. Uh, the reason for it, uh, basically, they're more generous with their unemployment benefits in European countries. Um, in the U.S., if you lose your job, you can file for unemployment and the government will give you some money to keep you afloat for six months. They cut you off after six months uh, when everything is standard and functioning as it should be. Uh, unemployment benefits in some European countries are indefinite, so there's no limit, right? They're going to pay you benefits until you can find another job and you don't need it. Um, it's, it's very much like a socialist um, idea um, providing for people as long as they need it but it does provide an incentive for people not to quite search as hard uh, for a new job because they're still getting paid fairly generously and there's no cutoff date coming um, so that's one of the reasons economists thinks think that the natural rate in these European countries is higher because of these kind of like socialist unemployment benefits Okay, so the unemployment rate can uh, misdiagnose the actual unemployment uh, because of a few things, okay? So when we're talking about who's actually out of work, these don't get counted, right? Remember to be counted, you have to be, uh, to be unemployed, you have to be actively searching for a new job, and you have to be in the labor force, right? So discouraged workers, 
uh, people who no longer are looking for a job because they've basically given up, right? They've looked and looked, they haven't been able to find work. So they just kind of give up and go on, right? So you can look at what's called the labor force participation rate. It's the percentage of the population in the labor force. If people leave the labor force, the unemployment rate falls, right? So if we have less participants, it's gonna lead to there, right? So discouraged workers lead to lower unemployment rates, right? Even though in reality, they're still unemployed people, right? They've just lost hope and given up. Um, underemployed workers aren't counted in the unemployment rate. So someone who wants more hours, but they can't get them is still considered employed. If you're working at McDonald's, 20 hours a week, but you really want to work full time, but they won't give you the hours, right? That's called an underemployed worker. We could be producing more. You're there, you're capable of producing more, right? Adding more to our GDP, but you don't get that opportunity, right? So that's underemployed. That kind of messes with the unemployment rate a little bit. Uh, and then when we look at the unemployment rate, we don't ever, we j we're just looking at the general population. So it doesn't do anything for race or age. Um, the overall unemployment rate doesn't show you any disparities in minorities and teenagers and things like that. You can break down the data. Um, certain age demographics are going to be far more unemployed than others. Certain races are going to have way higher unemployment rates than others. Um, so it gives us the general number, but it doesn't really get into the details. If you get into the slides and you click this link, I'm not gonna pull it up for the sake of time, but if you click that, it gives you kind of all of that data, who's unemployed, what age is, things like that. So if you wanna get in there and look at that, go ahead. All right, I, I kind of shortened this one down a little, just hit the key points. So that gets us to the end here. Um, hopefully that's helpful. Um, I'll get this posted and have a great day.